as the children leave, I'd like to ask you to pray with me and pray for me, by the way. Lord, I come to you now and on behalf of the people that I get to serve and those that will hear your word, I pray that all of the distractions, all of the noise, everything that the enemy would intend to do to distract us from you and your word will right here, right now be laid silent. May your spirit and your scriptures now lead us as a people in pursuit of you and your glory. I pray this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. If you were about to set out on a journey, on a trip, and it was your goal to reach the peak of Mount Everest, if you were literally going to go into the Himalayas with the purpose and the plan of cresting Mount Everest, let me ask you about your investment in your hope for a tour guide. Let's talk a little bit about what your expectations and hopes would be for that tour guide. Would you, I think, hope that your tour guide remembered what he was taught? Do you hope that the tour guide would remember that which the Lord his Lord, his teacher, his master had taught him in preparation to be a tour guide. Would you hope that your tour guide had considered all that was in the training? That your tour guide had considered the full scope of what was intended to be taught? That your tour guide would consider all that you needed to know as he led you on that journey. Let me ask you this. Would you hope that your tour guide would be ready, willing, and able to imitate the best of the tour guides that had taught him as he now gets ready to lead you? Would you, if you bring this all together, would you hope as you get ready to crest Everest, or at least try to, would you hope that your tour guide had remembered what was taught, considered all of what is involved, and then imitated the very best of the instructors that that tour guide had learned from? Would you hope such a thing? I dare say without question or hesitation that we would all hope for this. Well, let me bring you to God's word today with the understanding that you might be that tour guide. What if, instead of crowning the, the top of Everest, what if instead you were the Christian that was here designed to lead another to the mountaintop of Christ? That you were going to be that tour guide. How important is it that you remembered what you were taught? That you considered all that your disciple would need to understand as you were now going to lead them through and to Christ Jesus and would you seek to imitate the very best of disciple makers that had poured into you well here we are today friends in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 and I say to you that that's exactly what God in his word would say to you and me as professing Christians Today I speak to primarily professing Christians and anybody that's here or within the sound of my voice that is not yet a Christ follower, you have an opportunity to listen in to a family discussion and I pray be inspired as you are informed and you watch the people of God being inspected by God's word. I pray that you'll be drawn closer to our King. You see, the big idea today is, as we continue in Hebrews 13, it is to understand that love listens and disciples. Love, biblical love, listens and disciples. And biblical disciples listen and love. You will see in Hebrews 13, verse 7, this thrust. And I tell you in advance that last week, if you were with us, we spent over two hours going deep, deep, deep into the details of understanding love and worship. Today, I'm going to zoom out to the top of the Himalayas. 
where you and I are going to get a big picture understanding of what this looks like in the form of leadership and living and loving like Christ. For you see, if you are in fact a disciple, then you've been called to listen and to love. And as that disciple, you're to listen and love like Christ. That's who we are. This is the continuing exhortation of Hebrews. And remember, an exhortation is a warning wrapped in encouragement. So we are here to exalt Christ and exhort the church to live and love like Christ. That's your call, Christian. And again, if you're not a Christ follower, this is what you could and should expect of those Christ followers around you. And those that are not living up to this standard, they're either in the midst of a stumble or they're a sinner who has not yet been saved by grace. Because God and his word are very clear. These are the expectations. Let me read for you God's word and take you on a journey today that I pray will change the way you think, change the way that you live, change the way that you are who you are for the rest of your life. Here's God's word. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Listen for three verbs. Remember, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Remember, consider, and imitate. Let me profess to you right here and right now that this is a definition of discipleship. This is the great commission. This is the great commandments being lived out. We have in Hebrews 13, 7, a summation of Christianity. Do you, do you hear the big picture? Do you see the purpose and the particulars? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Friends, I want to use our time together today to literally zoom out and just give you this big idea to help you to see. When we talk about remember the leaders who shared with you the word of God, remember this is the head. Consider, that's the heart. Imitate, that's the hands. Think about it. Remember what? The word of God, God's word. Consider what? The will, God's will for your life in full context. Imitate what? Imitate Christ and the early church and be his bride. Remember the message. Consider the mission. When you imitate, you become a mirror through which the world could and should see Christ and his church. Here's what I'd like to share with you just to begin. Again, 50,000 foot level. Remember the word of God. Remember the gospel, the gospel. Let me show it to you. We call it the stick man gospel around here as a way for you to see it. We know when we remember not just the leaders, but what the leaders shared with us, the word of God, that we know that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 tells us that the word of God is his authority. It's all God breathed. That in the beginning, Genesis 1, 1, God created everything. John 1, that in the beginning of the word was with God, the word was God. Jesus is God. We know per the word of God, this is what was shared with us. Remember, you and I have all been born dead in need of a miracle. Ephesians 2, 1, you've been dead in your sins without the grace of God. That only Christ Jesus, the Messiah, John 14, 6, can get you home to heaven. And that if, in fact, this is truly you, then we know for, per Acts 1, 8, that you will have received the power that makes you now this missionary. We all start off dead. We, we have an enemy that is prowling around like a roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, 8, that ultimately will not only blind you, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, but will convince you through spiritual warfare that all these truths of God are foolishness, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. What is part of the foolishness? The fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3:23, and that the wages of sin are death for everyone, Romans 6:23. There's going to be a barrier as you try to get to Christ. You see, you're not going to want to do it, and you're not going to be able to overcome that hurdle unless, 
Again, that miracle, John 6, Jesus tells us that no one's going to come to me unless the Father draws them. And there'll be no hostages in heaven. If, in fact, I'm drawing you, if, in fact, you're going to come, you're going to need to, this is a prerequisite, repent and believe. There'll be nobody in heaven who has not repented and believed through the miraculous application of God's grace, that miracle which brings us to Christ Jesus. To Christ Jesus alone, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. He's the only one. He's the only one. Think of John 3, 36. Those who believe in him have life, but those who do not obey do not have life. The wrath of God instead abides on them. Again, you can go to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. This is the Messiah, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, biblical belief, then you will be saved. It's in Christ alone, the Messiah, where this miracle happens. That's what the fathers told us. That's the word of God. And if that's true, then now you'll pick up your cross and you'll follow him. Good news is, is on the bad days, Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation if you're truly in Christ, even if you stumble. Bad news, if you think you can live on a stumble and this doesn't matter, you've missed 1 John 2.6, that those who claim to be in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. Again, note, before the cross... And after the cross, the divine sovereignty and the human responsibility tension that is the Christian life. Now, if this is truly you, you become that missionary. You pick up your cross daily and you follow Jesus. Luke uh, 14, 27. You're going to live a life of sacrifice. That's going to be your act of worship is a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. Some days that sacrifice is going to get a little ugly because you're going to meet some people. Part of your witness and your role as a missionary is to confront those who are teaching what they ought not teach and who need to be silenced. Titus 1, 11. Now be careful because if you've nodded your head yes, know this, that there's still another risk. There's two warnings to this truth of the gospel, this thing that you and I need to remember. We need to watch out for those that are going to try to jump over the cross, come to Christ, not as a Christ follower, but as somebody who's just got religious, not supernaturally related to Christ. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus himself ends the Sermon on the Mount with a double banked warning. Don't be those that will one day hear him say, away from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. You built your house on the sand. You thought you were going to be fine until the storm came. Well, guess what? It's storm day. Gone. Don't be such a person. Listen, remember this truth. Submit to it. And watch out for those wolves who will tunnel underneath. Acts 20, 29. Those ravenous wolves who will come up from amongst you. The ravenous wolves that Jesus himself warned about. When he said, listen, you're my sheep. I'm sending you out amongst wolves. Therefore, you need to be shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. You see, friends, this is the remembering that I pray you will embrace. Now, when you remember this truth, it's going to lead you now to consider. Consider the leaders who told you these truths, not the ones that tickled your ears, not the ones that told you peace, peace, when there was no peace, but those who told you this truth. And consider the outcome of their lives. Consider the fullness of what this means. I would say it to you this way. Consider the fundamentals of the faith. Consider the full context of what this gospel looks like. Understand that fundamentally, you're going to need to hold to the foundations of God's word, God's will, and God's ways. That's it. In a nutshell, unless you're building on that foundation, that three-legged stool, God's word, God's will, God's ways, you're in trouble. And you need to consider those who tell you this and those who don't. You need to consider the framework of all human history to understand that all of humanity is in one of five places. They're either lost, they're new baby lovers of God, they're developing as learners, adolescent Christians, praise God they're blossoming into leaders, or perhaps they're those people who are the lifers who are now multiplying multipliers. Those in whom God's grace most beautifully resides as it multiplies in the same way that Christ called his children to do and be in the Great Commission. 
to recognize that everybody starts lost. And unless the miracle of God's grace is acted upon somebody, which is then received by faith and applied with repentance, that they will stay forever in the dark of the abyss. They will be born and die in sin and end up in a very real hell. It brings us a sense of urgency to understand that if, in fact, you have been captured by grace and drawn out of that abyss, again, consider the lives of those who have shown you what it looks like to go back into the fire, says Jude, and snatch some out. Those who didn't come to be served, but to serve like Christ and give your life as a ransom for many. Those who would not just simply say, well, praise God, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. I'm sitting back on the couch. No, those that would grow spiritually to be who God has called and created you to be, that would take that step up to becoming that learner. And that adolescent wouldn't stay at home playing video games till they're 40. They would grow into that leader that begins to pour out, changing the posture of going up to being poured out. And that leader would one day come to the place of saying, as good as this leadership role has been, I know there's more. I want to go all in. I want to be that sold out no matter what representative of my Redeemer who's going to live helping to multiply the family of God. That's what it is to consider. To consider the lives of those who are just playing games and those who are children of God. Those who are literally living out the full context, full blossoming beauty of Christianity versus those who are simply sitting back trying to work a maintenance program called ministry. Those who are really pursuing comfort instead of the cross. Those who live with an indecisive mind going back and forth straddling the fence versus those who have that truly undivided heart that's all in for Christ. What do you remember? What have you considered? Who and what are you trying to imitate? I offer it to you yet again at the end of the verse, simple. Imitate the faith of those leaders who taught you the truth and have considered the full context of Christianity. Imitate their faith. Be those who demonstrate that you have heard the word of God. You've heard the exhortation and the exaltations of Hebrews. You're turning away from where you were heading and you're coming home to Christ. That you're going to be one who says, persecute me if you will. I will not sell out my king. I will not settle or compromise for comfort. I'm going in and I'm pursuing the cross. I'm not going to be somebody who's going to seek out a maintenance program. I'm ready to sacrifice for the mission. I will not be held hostage by an indecisive mind. I'm going to be one, praise God, by His grace and for His glory that literally shows the world an undivided all-in heart. Oh, my prayer is that that's who you and I want to be. I want to bring somebody else in to share this with you in a way that, again, I pray changes the way you think about things forevermore. Watch this, and then we'll come back and close. If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does, uh, let me invite you to open with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I want to encourage and challenge you today with three questions that I believe are critical for you to answer as a church and as individual followers of Christ. And the way you answer these questions will have significant bearing on the extent to which you are an instrument in God's hand for His glory in the world. So I didn't just make these questions up. They come directly from the end of Luke chapter 9. So I want to read these verses in a moment, and then I want to do something a little unique. I have spent over the last few years some concentrated time in some remote regions in the Himalayas, and God has used time in the Himalayas there to rock my perspective on my life, on my faith, on the church. In such a way, I, I just, part of me would love to take multitudes 
of you with me into the Himalayas. It's not possible this morning. So what I want to do is try to bring a taste of them to you. And the reason I want to do that in light of this text, the first time I was trekking on those trails, I was reading through Luke in my Bible reading at that point. And I was reading this text and some others that I want us to walk through. And so based on God's word, I want to put these questions before you. They're not easy questions to ask or answer. But I, I think they're questions we must ask and answer. We will inevitably answer in our lives and in the church. So let's start where we need to in the word of God. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. The Bible says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, him being Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Three questions. Number one. Are you going to choose comfort or are you going to choose the cross? In your life, right where you are sitting, are you going to choose comfort or are you going to choose the cross? In this church, are you going to choose comfort or the cross? The first man in this story says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. He's eager, willing. Now, we know from other accounts, Mark's account, that this man was a teacher of the law. It was customary for guys like this to kind of attach themselves to another teacher to sort of promote themselves, to gain standing. Jesus was pretty popular with the crowds at this point. So he's got somebody eagerly trying to follow him in order to advance himself. Jesus replies, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, if this man followed Jesus, he was not guaranteed a roof over his head. And in this way, Jesus made crystal clear that Christianity is not a path to more comforts, higher status, or greater ease in this world. The road of following Jesus is not paved with self-advancement. It actually starts with self-denial picking up a cross. You look back up in verse 51 in Luke 9. The days drew up for him to be taken up, drew near for him to be taken up. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is headed to a cross, which is why he says up earlier in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said to all these people who are following him, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? His cross daily and follow me. Now, we hear those words and Today, we have reverence, respect for the cross. We've got to put ourselves, though, in the shoes of first century hearers who heard that. This was, this was not an appealing thing to the crowds. We, we wear crosses around our, our necks, put them up in our homes. Like, you didn't do that in the first century. It'd be like wearing an electric chair around your neck. It's creepy. <laughs> or having electric chairs over your dining room table. And people aren't coming back over for dinner. It's your house. Like this is a, a picture of death, dying to yourself. And that is the initial invitation. So let's be clear. Everything we're talking about here in this text is not like for really mature followers of Jesus. This is initially what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to choose a cross over the comforts of this world. And we see this, so let's just take a quick tour. Take a right in your Bible, go to the next chapter, Luke chapter 10. Listen to Jesus' words, calling away from comfort toward dying to yourself. Luke chapter 10, verse 3, sends out his disciples. He says, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. 
Just in case you're wondering, a lamb doesn't go into the middle of wolves looking for comfort. A lamb goes into the middle of wolves expecting to lay down his life. Chapter 10, verse 25. This lawyer comes up to Jesus. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what's written in the law? And the response in verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, which leads into the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story about loving the least likely people to love, about sacrificing to love the least likely people. Keep going. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Jesus is speaking to religious leaders. He says, woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. He basically says, you keep your religious practices, great, but you sit back and settle for injustice in the world around you. Sure, you're in the synagogue every day, you give pennies as a tithe, but You're not doing what God has called you to do to show his love for the oppressed and the poor. You're keeping most for yourselves, which leads to his stinging indictment in the next chapter. Look at chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. I give you a recipe for success in our world. Our country says success is building up as much as you can. Store it away for a rainy day. Enjoy all this world has to offer. It's what the world says is success. What does God say? Verse 20, God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Say, what does it mean to be rich toward God? Jump down to verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We could keep going on. All the way to chapter 16, we see a powerful picture of a rich man who ignored the poor at his gate and finds out in eternity that he had totally missed the point. So the call of Christ is clear. Sell possessions. Give away possessions. Give your life for those in need. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, let's go into the Himalayas for a minute. We helicopter in to about 12,000 feet where we land. It's the highest village in this particular region where you can basically still maintain life if you call what's around you life. They did some research in these particular villages not long ago, and they found that half of the children in these villages were dying before their eighth birthday. I have four kids. One of my greatest fears is something happening to one of them. I can't imagine that being an expectation for half of them. They're dying of preventable diseases. They get a cut, like my kids get outside when they're playing. It gets infected, it overtakes their body, there's no medicine. They drink a drop of unclean water in a way that can lead to an entire outbreak. One, One village had a cholera outbreak that over the course of two days killed 60 people, just like that. One mom had 14 kids, two made it to adulthood. So severe poverty, and then to see trafficking as a byproduct of this poverty, because a trafficker comes into a village like this, 
and sees a family with a young girl. And it doesn't take a lot of convincing to say, we can take your daughter into the city where we can get her a good job. She can make good money and send it back up here to help you and your family. She'll come back up and visit periodically. Sounds better than the conditions she's in. So they'll take young girls down from these villages, either into the city or across the border, never to return home again and not to a good job. They're taken down from the mountains and put into brothels where they are drugged and broken to the point where they have 10, sometimes 15 men a day do whatever they want with them. We were doing, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Himalayas, and we were doing an art therapy session with some girls who had been rescued from trafficking. There was an eight-year-old girl in this therapy session. I, I have an eight-year-old girl. So I'm walking these trails and I'm reading Love Your Neighbor as Yourself and I'm thinking as myself. Like, if this was happening to my daughter, like my little girl, I'd, I'd do something. What if this were our kids, our girls, our kids dying of preventable diseases? It, it would change the way we live, wouldn't it? If we loved our neighbors as ourselves in this world, like, it would change what we prioritize in the church, I think. In our lives, when we come together in the church, if we loved our neighbors as ourselves, if we were caring for the poor like we care for ourselves. But here's the danger. If we're not careful, we can create a pretty comfortable picture of Christianity where we live our entire Christian lives in the comfortable confines of the church, all the while turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to urgent physical need right around us and all around the world. And I, I get it. Like, I walk through these trails. I see poverty. I go down in the city. I see these brothels where these girls are put. And I, I just want to stick my head in the sand and pretend it's not real. And there's a part of me that just wants to jump on a plane as soon as I can, get back home where I can just live like this is not real. But I guess that's the danger. I, I can do that. You can do that. You can move on Monday morning, tomorrow, and just pretend like we didn't even dive into this here today. I'll tell one more story I'm not proud of at all. So we had been told as we're walking the trails, so we're trekking, and we have packs with a few snacks in them. And the people we're working with are doing all kinds of things to uh, address poverty in these villages. Uh, and they had asked us uh, not to just, I mean, with the snacks they have, when people ask, not to just start handing out snacks because that actually ends up creating some more problems on multiple levels. So it made sense. So we get to this one particular village. Not a lot of people in this village. Just a few kids came running up as we're, we're just passing through the village, really short village. These few kids come running up, and one of them is a little girl about my daughter's age. And she's got a big smile on her face. And we're just, we're just kind of playing with the kids as we're walking. This girl latches onto my hand, and so we're walking hand in hand as we go down the trail. And just smiling, not able to communicate her language, but uh, able to communicate in ways that supersede language. And so just smiling, playing as we're going. And we get near the end of the village, and all the guys are ahead of me are kind of getting beyond the village. And so I turn around because it's time for us to go, but she starts holding onto my hand tight. And with her other hand, she reaches out her hand to me for me to give her something. She puts her hand to her mouth like, can you give me something to eat? So I froze at first and then just kind of shook my head. And then she reached for my pack 
And so suddenly I found myself like turning my pack away from her. And at this point, her smile has gone off her face. Now it's more of like this angry look, like, I know you have something. Like, can you please give me something? And so I started, I'm trying to pull my hand away at this point, and she's grabbing on all the tighter. So I find myself finally just yanking my hand away. And as soon as I do, she looks at me, and she tries to spit on me. She's not able to because she doesn't have enough saliva, so it just kind of comes on her own chin. And uh, I turn, and I walk away. I don't want that to be the story of my life. In a world of urgent physical need, I don't want the story of my life to be, I turned and walked away. And I want to encourage you, don't let it be the story of your life. Don't let it be the story of this church. Will you choose? So this is the thing, in order to Follow Christ, the picture's clear. It is a call to let go of the comforts of this world, to die to yourself, and to live to lay down your life for others around you. So that's the question. Are we going to choose the comforts of this world, or are we going to choose the cross of Christ to lay down our lives to show the compassion of God? That's question number one. Question number two. Are you going to settle for maintenance or are you going to sacrifice for mission? Are you going to settle for maintenance or are you going to sacrifice for mission? Luke 9, 59 and 60, Jesus says, follow me to the second man. This man says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now scholars debate whether or not this guy's dad had died yet or not. Some believe his dad was about to die. So he just wanted to go back, spend the last couple of days with his dad before he died, give him a proper burial, which is obviously something he would want to do, and more than that, was something he would be expected to do, need to do, like an obligation. And then he would follow Jesus. Others believe his dad had just died. Like, I remember the moment when my brother called me to tell me that my dad, best friend in the world, had just unexpectedly, out of the blue, died from a heart attack. I remember falling on the floor and sobbing uncontrollably. So I can't imagine in that moment or in the evening or the next morning hearing Jesus say, let somebody else do the funeral. There's more important things for you to focus on. There's an urgency here. So what is so urgent? What is so important, even more than the things maybe we would most want or I feel like we need to do in this world. What's urgent is, Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Proclaim the kingdom of God. So why is that so urgent? So this is where, especially if you are here and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to listen particularly closely. One, I am so glad you're here. I'm so glad. I know in a room this size there are many who are exploring Christianity, finding out more about Christianity. Well, here is the good news of the kingdom, the good news that is the center of this book. There is one true God over us all. He's created us all. He sustains us all. The reason we are breathing right now is because he is giving us breath. Were he to stop, so would we. And we have all sinned against God. Every one of us has turned from our own ways, from his ways to our own ways. It looks different in all of our lives. We've all sinned against God, and as a result, we are all separated from God. And if we die in this state of separation from God, then we will spend eternity separated from God. And you look around the religions of the world, and you will find all kinds of recipes for how to get back to God. Do these things. Take these steps. Pray this amount of times. Follow these rituals, whatever it might be. But the good news of the Bible is that we don't have to earn our way to God because God has come to us. 
God has come to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus has lived a life none of us could live, a life of perfect obedience to God. He had no sin in his life for which to die, and yet he chose to die. Well, if he didn't die for his sin, whose sin was he dying for? Jesus chose to die for your sin. My sin. Jesus chose to pay the price for your and my sin against God. But the good news keeps getting better because he didn't stay dead for long. Jesus, three days later, rose from the dead in victory over sin. So that anyone, anywhere, including anyone in here at Cumberland right now who puts their faith in Jesus, ask God to forgive you of your sins through trust in his love for you, you will be forgiven of all your sin and reconciled into a relationship with God for all of eternity. It's the greatest news in the world. Your life can change forever today. Like forever. 10 billion years from now, different today because of the good news of the kingdom of God. The king has come to save us from our sins. So, that's good news, and it needs to be made known. So now go to the Himalayas with me. You walk on that first day or two on the trails, and you ask people, what do you know about Jesus? Do you know what they say to you? They say, who's that? They've never heard his name. Like, nothing. Know nothing about Jesus. It's like you're talking about somebody in a village over here that they've never met before. So in that moment, it hits you. Just, to, just picture this. You're on these mountain trails. There is majestic beauty all around you. Like you're at 12,000 feet in the air, and it's like you're in a valley. There are mountain, snow-capped mountain peaks all around you. Just, you want to take a picture everywhere you turn. The beauty, the glory of God in creation. And yet in that moment it hits you. That for the last 2,000 years, these mountains have been shouting the glory of God. Declaring his greatness and his grandeur. But not for one second have these mountains said anything about what Jesus did on the cross. Mountains are silent about that because that is a privilege reserved for you and me. You and I, in God's design, get to do what the majesty of mountains can't even do. We get to make the good news known to people of how they can go from eternal death to eternal life. So here's the question then. If that's true, that's a privilege that we have, uniquely we have, then why is it the case that not just a few people in some remote regions in the Himalayas, why is it the case that there are over two billion people in the world today who have little to no knowledge of the gospel? Two billion people. Just like you and me, Except they've never heard the good news of the kingdom. How is that possible? 2,000 years later. You have never even heard his name? Have no idea about who he is? I think the only explanation for that is we have settled for maintenance. We've created a whole picture of Christianity where we are content to sit back and soak in and sing about the gospel week after week after week in our church setting while we've never given second thought to how we can get the gospel to people in places that haven't even heard it. We think that's somebody else's job. Or maybe we give a little here or there, we throw relative pennies at the most pressing problem, the most significant injustice in the world. People have never even heard the name of Jesus, the love of Jesus. So Passion City Church, if there are two billion people who have little to no knowledge of the gospel, and you as a church know and love and celebrate and sing this gospel as you do, as you should, 
then surely, surely God is calling multitudes of men and women from this church to take the gospel to those who've never heard it. Not like one or two here or there, like multitudes. I was in South Korea recently. There was one church at a point where they had 3,000 people. Their pastor said, our goal is in the coming years to send out 2,000 missionaries. <laughs> 2,000 missionaries. It's like two-thirds of the church. 25 years later, they did it. They sent out their 2,000th missionary from their church. I, I, I share that to encourage you. Like, this church has massive potential for reaching the nations with the gospel. But it will not happen if you settle for maintenance in any way. If you settle into a status quo Christianity, don't do it. Don't do it. Sacrifice for mission. Everybody laying down your life saying, Lord, do you want me to go? You want my family to go? Everybody. You say, this, this feels like this is too, like, too far. This is like really for mature Christians. This is basic discipleship. If you're going to follow Jesus, Luke 14, you renounce all you have. So, everybody, Lord, are you leading me to go? And if he doesn't lead you to go, then he's leading you to sacrifice a chunk of your salary to support somebody's salary who's going. Sacrifice is the right word here. You, those mountains, there's a reason the gospel hasn't gone there. There's a lot of resistance to the gospel going there. Most places in the world where the gospel is not yet gone, there are reasons. It's hard to reach those places, difficult, even dangerous in some ways. All the easy places are taken. The, my friends who work in these mountains, uh, 20 years ago when they started going up there, they were immediately told, if you keep bringing this message of Jesus into these mountains, uh, we will kill you. They kept coming. They kept coming and, and people died. Think about one couple who came to Christ. And as soon as they came to Christ, they were totally ostracized in their village. They, uh, they were told they couldn't use the water source anymore. They were totally abandoned by every, their whole support system around them. And then one day, this couple was out on uh, working in the fields, walking along the trails, and the word came back to their kids that a landslide had come and hit, rocks hit the mom and dad and they went tumbling down the mountain to their death. And to this day, the story is told in that village that if you believe in Jesus, you'd be introducing a foreign God into these mountains. And remember what happened to that one couple who did that. The real story though, is a landslide didn't come. The village leaders are the ones who took rocks and stoned that man and woman. But let's not fool ourselves into thinking that mission doesn't come without cost. So, the question is, are you gonna settle for maintenance or are you gonna sacrifice for mission? Now all that leads to this third question and it is the most important one because it all hinges on this. Here's the third question. Will your life be marked by an indecisive mind or an undivided heart? What's going to mark your life? An indecisive mind or an undivided heart? This last guy says, I will follow you, Lord. Let me just go back and say farewell to those at my home. I just want to go say goodbye to my family, friends. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, don't even go back. Don't have indecision. When you get back there and you start to think, is this wise? Is this good? I know you fix your eyes, your heart on me, and you follow me with all you've got. And I use this language because I think indecisive mind, like this is certainly my tendency and then yours, like, hear a message like this and then think, okay, I need to do something. I wonder what I should do. And a week later, like, I, I need to do something. Like, I wonder what I should do. A month, a year go by. 
At some point, I'm going to do something. And this is not the life Jesus has called us to live. He's called us to live with an undivided heart. Listen to this language from Luke 14, 25 to 26. Great crowds following Jesus, he turns and says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What is that about? Hate your family? Now, obviously, we know from other places in Scripture we are called to love our spouse. We're called to love our parents, our children. The point here Jesus is making very clear, though, is that when you follow Jesus, your love for him makes your closest relationships in this world look like hate in comparison. Love him with everything you've got. And this is the key question. Like, where is your heart? Let me give you one more picture in the Himalayas. We, we hiked this one really steep mountain, like brutal hike. And uh, the kind of hike, like five steps, and then you want to stop and just look at the scenery. And five more steps, and then you want to stop again. And like just a long time. So we finally get up there. We're staying there for the night. And we, we hear that there's a church in this five or so days in the, in the trek, the church that has been formed in this little community. And so we walk out, it's totally pitch black, and we look down the mountains, and we see, to look down the mountain, we see these little lights coming up the trails. And I said to the guy who works up there, I said, I said what, what are those lights? He said, the, that's the people from the church, they're coming for a gathering. And I immediately thought, these are going to be some of the most fittest church members I have ever met. <laughs> like hiking in pitch black dark up that trail that I'm going to be sore from for days. So we gather together in this little room. I mean, just a small portion of the stage. One little light bulb hanging in the middle for worship. And we're sitting in there as they start to come in. And with all due respect, they are not the, the fittest followers of Jesus I've ever met. They are older, frail women. Their kids they're moms with kids on their backs. And they all file in and they sit like basically on top of each other. We're crammed in this little room. And they sing with joy. And they open up the Bible and they encourage one another. They share about persecution they're facing. And I look around the room and I see the faces of people whose heart belongs to Jesus. Like they don't have the stuff of this world. They don't have the stuff of this church world. But they have Jesus and he's enough for them. So I guess that's the real question. Like is Jesus enough for us? This is the whole, it's the crux of it all. Like, remember, it's not Luke, but Matthew 13, 44. Remember that little parable Jesus tells? He talks about a man who's walking in a field. He comes upon a treasure, stumbles upon this treasure. Nobody else knows it's there. And he realizes this treasure is worth more than everything else I have put together. So what does he do? He covers it up and he goes and the text says he sells everything he has. The text actually says, with gladness, like with a smile on his face, he sells everything he has. I can imagine people coming up to him saying, why are you selling everything you have? He says, I'm going to buy that field over there. And they say, why are you going to buy that field? That's absurd. That's so foolish. And he smiles. He's like, I got a hunch. (laughs) He smiles. Why? Because inside he knows that he has found something that is worth losing everything for. I give you a picture of Jesus. He is someone worth losing everything for. We're talking about the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the final amen. He's the bread of life. Christ, our creator, our deliverer, our everlasting father. He is God. He's the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the great high priest, the holy one. He's the image of the invisible God, the judge of the living and the dead. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He's majestic. He's mighty. No one compares to him. The only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. He's the 
power of God is the resurrection and the life. The supreme sacrifice is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is all of these things. So the question is, does your heart belong to him? Because when it does, then you say to these questions, these questions all of a sudden get turned on their head because they don't sound hard. They sound inviting. You say, what do you mean inviting? Yes, I choose the cross over comfort because the life I have in Christ is better than all the comforts of this world put together. It turns it all on its side. This is not just casual, say a prayer, move on with your life, Christianity. This is real following Christ. Yes, I wanna sacrifice for mission instead of settle for maintenance. I don't wanna waste my life in this world. I've got a few years here. I wanna make them count for what's gonna matter, not just for my 401k. I wanna make it count for what's gonna matter four billion years from now. So yes, I'll settle sacrifice for mission because my heart is enthralled with Jesus. And I don't wanna to get to the end and stand before him and say, I thought about doing some things for you. I want to stand before him on that day and say, my life was yours. Like, I know, I know, I know. Like, some of the things we're talking about here are, sound hard, sound almost frightening. You might be afraid to say, I mean, to lay down your life, say, God, you lead me anywhere in the world, I'll go. But here's the good news. If you can trust Jesus to save you for all of eternity, then surely you can trust him to lead you on this earth. And not just to lead you, but to satisfy you every step of the way. When you realize who Jesus is, you realize it's not dangerous to surrender to him. It's dangerous to not surrender to him. Well, I pray, I pray that as you look at Hebrews 13, 7, that you will remember Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, that you will consider the outcome of their lives and that you will, in fact, imitate their faith. That, that's what David just shared. This is a beautiful application of this verse. And you and I could go all through the scripture and repeat it over and over and over again because this is the singular message of scripture. It is, again, Hebrews, it's the exaltation of Christ and the exhortation of the church to live and to love like him. And remember, you may never lead a tour to or through the Himalayas, but if you claim Christ, you're supposed to give a tour to heaven. And you need to remember the gospel. You need to be able to consider the fullness of the fundamentals, to know the foundations, to understand the framework of human history, to speak to the facts. And listen, there's no evolution. We weren't tadpoles. We start with creation. Then we had corruption. Then Christ came. Then he birthed the church. And he's coming home to close this thing down. And between now and then, you're going to be in a fight from the children of Satan fighting against you to come to Christ, to then once you become a Christian, the children of Satan and the flesh and the world trying to fight to hold you back from living for Christ. If in fact you truly have come to the faith, then, then you'll be the family of God. You'll have a love that goes up, a love that comes in, and a love that goes out. As you truly love and serve in a Christ-like way and create a culture that is the family of God's culture, and you'll tell the world, listen, this is forever. We're going from here to either heaven or hell. It's a little anticlimactic, but it's the truth. You'll remember, you'll consider, and then you'll imitate. I leave you with this. As our church family, but really as a biblical missionary, take to heart what David Platt just shared, what expounds upon Christ's teaching that you come to realize that if you are in fact a Christian, you are holding to the one true faith, that you are a part of the one true family of God, and that if this is true, you will live with that one focus, that you will seek to bring him glory by finding and growing more glorifiers. How? Through the power of his promised spirit, Acts 1.8, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, says Christ, locally, regionally, and globally. We say to the world, come and see, come and see. We promise you truth in love. And what does that look like? 
Well, there are loving distinctives. And here's why. Again, tour guide to heaven. Those of you that are going to claim Christ, if you want to live this out, you need to understand what it is that you're to share. We tell people, we, as the family of God, we are responding to His grace and we are repenting of our sin. We are trusting the Bible and we are obeying God's Word. Praise God, then we're growing in Christ and living Spirit-led all the while praying for guidance and then following by faith. And in that construct, we're dying to ourselves every day and we're picking up our crosses and following Him, showing the world that we're going to be the church, really loving one another, truly loving one another. That gets lived out as we equip the saints and then we exemplify supernatural unity that when we're doing this each time, we're going to be literally ministering to others as ambassadors. We're going to be literally demonstrating that we have for all the world to see a discerning that is shrewd, no matter what the situation is. We're going to worship the Lord vertically. We're going to experience Him horizontally. We're going to proclaim the gospel no matter what. We're going to fish for men in this process. We're going to make discipled warriors. And we're going to win spiritual warfare. All ultimately while loving our king and serving his kingdom. Let us remember. Let us consider. And let us imitate all to the glory of God. Again, this is a 50,000 foot view of a rock-solid biblical core that I pray will change the way you and I forever live from this day forward. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you would die that we could live, that we could live and not leave the world dead in their sins, but that we get to be your ambassadors. Lord, may we remember your gospel truth. May we consider the full context of Christianity and may we imitate both Christ and the early church as tour guides from here to heaven, knowing that we're dealing with many folks that are on their way to hell. Give us your sense of urgency, your compassion, your priorities, and your power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.